Hi everybody. Hello and welcome to our Facebook Live question and answer. We are Dr. Rami Caldas, myself, and Dr. Peng Kui Wong, my associate at the Caldas Center. We are looking forward to answering your questions tonight and hearing all about what's on your mind. Thank you to everyone who submitted questions to Facebook already. If you have not sent your question yet, feel free to post it on Facebook Live and we will do our best to answer it tonight. If you would like to submit an anonymous question, please contact us using Facebook Messenger and indicate that you'd like to share your question but remain anonymous because we want everyone to feel comfortable during our chat tonight. This is a fun time of information and sharing. Before we begin, a reminder that this Q&A is meant to be for informational purposes only. If you have serious health, health concerns, make certain to contact your physician. If you'd like to contact us at the Calvis Center, visit calvacenter.com or call 920-886-2299. We'd love to talk to you. Remember, no referral is needed ever to visit the Calvis Center, regardless of what anyone might suggest. So, our first question comes to us from Kennedy. My menstrual cycle is really erratic. Some months it's right on time, and other months it doesn't come at all. What could be causing this to happen? Whoa, there are just a plethora of things that could be causing that, Kennedy. Do you want to try taking that on, uh, <laughs> Dr. Wong? Hey, yes, yes. So, um, for the irregular period, I would say, you know, um, really there's multiple reasons. And uh, the most common one, of course, is the PCOS. And one of the criteria for the, for the uh, diagnosis of PCOS is uh, irregular period, or so-called oligo- uh, Manorrhea. And the other things, for example, so you, we have to like, look at the whole picture and what the factors can, uh, what factors can affect the, uh, the cycles. For example, the brain, if you have, like, you know, the, the hypothalamus and the pituitary and go to the ovary, and anything wrong in your brain and the pituitary and the ovarian, ovarian hormones can affect your period. And besides this HPO, the axis, and something like the, uh, the thyroid, and, you know, the gland, either the hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, can also affect your period. Yeah. You know, stop the no, an excellent answer. Yeah. Uh, and, and so indeed, and the, the interesting thing about PCO and PCOS is a lot of people yeah. don't understand it. Even doctors struggle with it because you need to look at it like a continuum. And, and people think that you have to be really heavy and like, you know, have facial hair and this, that, and the other to be, have PCOS. But you can have polycystic ovaries mm -hmm. and have an mm -hmm. ultrasonic diagnosis of that, like the Europeans do, and be like really thin. Mm -hmm. So actually, you, people of all types of body habits can have that. Or the other things that Dr. Wong mentioned, the thyroid, the prolactin dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And obviously, those are hormonal things. Then there are physical things that can be causing it. And so it just needs a good evaluation and clarity. We pride our, on our, ourselves on clarity here at the Calvin Center. Exactly. Sometimes, for example, if you have the polyps even inside your uterus, and it can cause like irregular bleeding, and sometimes bleeding between the period as well. So you really worthwhile to do a thorough checkup from the anatomy side and the endocrinology side. Bingo. Okay, thank you, Kennedy. Thank you. And from Julie, my husband and I have been trying to get pregnant for the last six months with no success. What are we doing wrong? Well, why don't I uh, take that one? Julie, <laughs> you may be doing nothing wrong, Julie. Exactly. Oh my gosh. And, and six months, if, uh, certainly if someone is um, 35 years or older, is a really good time to look at things and see what's going on. Now, the normally fertile couple after a year will be pregnant 85% of the time. Any given month, you're looking at about a 20-25% chance of becoming pregnant if you're normally fertile in your 20s, okay, uh, Julie? And, and so, but after six months, then you're starting to get a little bit lower chance. Like after a year, your chances on your own, even if you're just timing it just right, are only about 4%, just statistically, not that you're a number, Julie. And so, I think what would be a really good idea is to simply do the basic evaluation for fertility uh, especially if you're uh, in your mid to late 30s. Um, if you want to keep trying for another uh, six months to make a whole year, if you're, if you're younger than that, Julie, then that is totally reasonable because you've got time. And um, you just want to time it 
So you're having relations, uh, you know, 14 days before the first day of your period. It doesn't matter when you had your last period, Julie, but when you're going to get your period. And so if your cycles are irregular, that makes it really tough. It's a moving target. But let's say you have a 28 day cycle as an example. That person is going to ovulate on day 14. Sperm will live for four days and egg will live for only 12 to 24 hours. Don't do those kits. I don't think that's a great idea. They'll drive you crazy. The best way to uh, become pregnant, timing it right, is have intercourse every other day beginning four days before you ovulate, which is 14 days before you're going to get your period. If you do put that into your app, I think that'll help a great deal. But if it doesn't happen in the next few months, uh, we would sure love to uh, have an opportunity to help you achieve your, uh, your goals of, it, of having a family, Julie. Thanks, Julie. Hey, and then there's a one from Tashana. How can you treat adenomyosis and endosalpingiosis? Well, Dr. Wong is an adenomyosis specialist. He is very good with that. So, so-called adenomyosis is basically because the cells in the endometrial lining invaginated to the muscle layer we call the myoma uh, myomatrin. So actually the adenomyosis is really common. So their study shows about 60% of the women has different type of, a different kind of uh, degree of the adenomyosis. The luckily most of the time the adenomyosis patient they are asymptomatic. That means they have the adeno adenomyosis but they don't have symptoms. When they have the symptoms, the main symptoms is the pain and abnormal bleeding. And in terms of like implantation or what we call it like infertility, it's controversial. Some people say adenomyosis affects the implantation. Some of the study shows there's no relationship. We don't know the exactly the, reason, uh, the, the, the data yet. For the adenomyosis, the endosalpingosis I would say like this, this is a term, most, most of people is like you change it to endometriosis. Exactly, right? it's just in my yeah. world it's just another exactly. way of saying endometriosis. Yeah. The endometriosis is another story, it's like the endometrial, in the, the cells from the endometrial lining up, go out of the uterus and spread in the pelvic, it's called, we call it endometriosis. I always tell my patient that the adenomyosis and the endometriosis, they are twin sisters. Most of the time they come together. Adenomyosis is about 60% of women have it, and the endometriosis about 10% of women has it, okay? But for my feeling, and if you have endometriosis, it's almost absolutely you have the adenomyosis. They all give you the same symptoms, okay? The bleeding, the pelvic pain, pain during the sex, and, um, okay, now, sorry, I, I, back to your question, how to treat them. And to treat them, the bottom line, I will say, all those diseases, they are not a cancer, okay? If they don't give you the trouble, you don't need to treat them. As I say, 60% of women has adenomyosis, you don't need to treat 60% of women. And the main, main symptoms give you the pain, bleeding, dysmenorrhea, and I will say it all depends on the age. I will treat my patient be, be, like it depends on the age. For the teenagers, for example, they show up, I will try to treat them with the medicine first, the hormone suppression, because they are very young. And the most of the time, they're, even they have the endometriosis, it's a superficial endometriosis, okay? But for the older, older patient, people like 30s or 40s, and I will go more aggressively do the surgery. And two reasons. Number one is for the diagnosis. The only diagnosis for endometriosis is the surgery. There's no imaging study, no lab test. And number two reason is for, for the treatment. Most of people, when they're like 30 or 40 years old, their endometriosis is deep infiltrating endometriosis. They probably tried all of the hormone suppression for more than 10 years, that didn't work. At this time, the only good treatment is the surgery. Unfortunately, I will say, rarely, rarely G1 doctors, okay, generally speaking, the OBGYN doctor, they don't feel comfortable to do the surgery for the endometriosis, the complicated case of the endometriosis. So we really need to find somebody who capable to do those surgeries. And at this point, 
the thorough excisional surgery make huge difference, okay, for the prognosis. And uh, I would suggest like if you have some so-called like dyspronia and pain during the sex, pain with the bleed, pain with the like period, heavy bleeding, you really need to find some people who is specialized as endometriosis, get a consult, and then you can see, get the idea. And what, what blows my mind, mm -hmm. uh, to elaborate a little bit, is that when, when someone gets an ultrasound, the adenomyosis can be looking, the doctor looking at the ultrasound, they can, it can be looking at, uh, at her in the face. Yeah. And she's, it, it, the ultrasound, nine out of 10 times is called normal in my True, 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 true. It yes. blows my mind. And yeah. then the next thing is, you know, even if you wish future fertility, you can still surgically treat adenomyosis, right? Mm -hmm. Dr. Wong has had very uh, interesting cases uh, lately where he literally removes, wedges out adenomyosis, for example, mm -hmm. at a C-section scar mm -hmm. in someone who wants to have more children or exactly. does not want a hysterectomy mm -hmm. for any reason. That's your body, yeah, we respect mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to have a hysterectomy to treat adenomyosis. And uh, too, too often, it's really a, truly a daily thing uh, at the Calvin Center, where we hear stories of uh, people coming in and saying, my doctor said there's nothing that anyone can do about it. Bah humbug. Nonsense. <laughs> Thank you, Tashanda. And from Angela, I think I have fibroids. What should I do? I hear that they often are harmless, but I've been experiencing some pain. Angela, here's yeah. our fibroid specialist <laughs> <Okay>. also. <laughs> I would like to take this question because I, I really are trained with my mentor for a lot of uh, different kind of uh, fibroid disease. You are right. Most of the time, the fibroid is harmless. It's not harmless. It's a benign disease. Okay. The malignant fibroid, the, the medical term is called a leomyosarcoma, is only 0.5%. It's really rare. Okay. So if we take the general population, the fibroid, since it's benign, you are right. If the patient is no, no symptoms, you definitely can leave it alone. Okay. I can see a lot of people say, oh, your fibroid is so big, you need to treat it, treat it. No, it's based on the size. We don't need to treat, we don't need to treat the fibroid based on the size, but based on the symptom. If you, the fibroid give you the pain, give you the pain during the sex, or you have a heavy bleeding, you definitely need to treat the fibroid. So how we treat the fibroid? So roughly speaking, we have three ways. Number one, we do medicine, okay? There's medical, the, we know the fibroid, the growth relies on the estrogen and the progesterone. And now we can give the patient a Lupron or other like uh, the progesterone receptor antagonist medication, which were approved just like uh, by the FDA. Those medications, unfortunately, they are temporary. For example, the Lupron cannot use more than for six months. The best treatment for the fibroid is still SA. It's based on if you want to keep the uterus or not keep the uterus and do the surgery. If you want to keep the uterus, we can do the myomectomy. Myomectomy, I mean laparoscopically or robotically. It's really, really harm. Like I, I think this right now, at the last times, if anybody do open surgery for the fibroid, it is wrong, okay? We can do minimally invasively, no matter how big is the fibroid. Okay, you can do bilateroscopic, you can do robot. And say, if you finish your, ma your family already, so you have three kids, you don't want to have more children, you want for definite treatment, you definitely can have the hysterectomy. Again, you can do like minimally invasively by laparoscope, a laparoscopy or robot. So if you have some pain right now, it really bothers you, I would suggest you have some doctors to take care of your fibroid instead of leave it alone, Angela. Yeah, I'm really thankful that we have Dr. Wong here treating fibroids uh, medically and surgically. Uh, Calvin Center has seen several people this year from the Chicagoland area that uh, they were advised, including at places, major university centers, that they needed to be cut open, and that is simply not the case. Uh, you can do these things minimally and basically, and most of the time go home even the same day and uh, just save yourself a lot of discomfort. But anyway, just a reminder, if you would like to set up a time to speak with the Calvin Center, you can call us at 920-886-2299 or visit calvacenter.com. And now we have an anonymous question, okay? 
Thank you. Sperm count is low, 5.2% motile, 18 months post vasectomy reversal. My endo lining is thin. Would Calda Center be able to help us without having to go through IVF? We would like to avoid that price tag if other local options are available. What I'd like to know from uh, this study, this uh, semen analysis, with the 5.2 million uh, or 5.2 percent total modal, I'm sorry, modal sperm, I need to know the total modal normal number, okay? And if the total modal normal number, it, we prefer it to be a million, but it can be a little bit less than that. But if we're looking at a few hundred thousand at least with a, a lining of six, we can totally do something about that because there are ways to make that lining better. We can use different medications. Do remember that the primary medications for ovulation induction used first do thin the lining. Clomid, which is an anti-estrogen, it's an estrogen uh, receptor binder, it's been around since the 1960s. Funny story, they were trying to find a contraceptive pill when they came up with Clomid, and the test subjects were getting pregnant. Uh -huh. But anyway, that was back in the 60s at the University of California, San Francisco. But then uh, that does thin the lining, and then high dose letrozole, the other oral agent used usually first, one of those two are the first ones used, uh, they both thin the lining. So maybe there needs to be an addition of injectables or estrogen. So I think that it definitely warrants a visit and an evaluation, an understanding of what the total modal normal number uh, to see how likely, say, inseminations with controlled ovarian stimulation uh, would be to work. And we'll be very upfront with you, but I'm betting that there's a decent chance that we can help without that huge price tag for IVF. So here's another anonymous question. Sex is really painful for me. My husband is understanding and tries to be as gentle as possible, but it hurts regardless. From my own research, it looks like it could be a number of different things, but what should I do to find out what's really going on? Oh boy, do you want to start with this one? Oh, uh, I can take the next one. Okay, okay. So. <laughs> that, that's the, the two, where, where is the pain coming from is the question I would have. This is such a, ref, uh, a, a challenging, situation for a couple and it is so disruptive and doctors are dismissive of it it drives me crazy but you've got to do a thorough exam where is the level of the pain is it the, at the opening is in the lower third of the vagina one lower one third of the vagina is it behind the uterus if it's at the opening frequently there can be something going on like a vulvar vestibulitis that is not hardly ever diagnosed and, it, and, and it's it's relatively easy to take care of and for the very, very refractory cases, then it can even be treated surgically, uh, almost uniformly successful surgery. Then there's the issue of pelvic floor dysfunction. Are you having muscle spasm, like vaginismus? But in my experience, vaginismus is coming from uh, either vestibulitis and the pelvic muscles are involuntarily contracting, or of course, endometriosis, because the number one reason the number one uh, uh, place for endometriosis to be is behind the uterus between the, uh, the vagina and the rectum. And that's why you need someone who knows how to do an exam to find endometriosis, and you'll find out during an exam, most likely, whether you likely have that or not. But the vestibulitis needs to be looked at, the vaginismus needs to be looked at, and then also the endometriosis possibility needs to be looked at. And then there's also the possibility that you have an unusual bird, something like an autoimmune dysfunction like lichen sclerosis of the vulva or lichen planus of, of uh, the vaginal mucosa. And all of that can be figured out in, uh, you know, with, and sometimes a tiny biopsy may be required, but it's totally, you can figure it out. And once you figure it out, this can be fixed. And there is a better life ahead of you, okay? So from Nikki, what is the follow-up for someone who had any